Hello, everybody. Welcome to our weekly Pirates chat. As always, I'm Andrew Destin, reporter here for the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette, joined by our Pirates beat reporter, Jason Mackey. We're recording this edition of the podcast after Monday night's game against the A's, which the Pirates won, uh, six win in a row. Uh, wild game. There's so much to unwrap from that one, just of uh, you know a game that was all over the board in terms of walks and all that sort of stuff. But uh, Jason, more importantly in the context, six win in a row, teams playing good baseball again. Uh, let's just start there. Overall, broad picture, what's working now for this team that at the end of May, uh, it looks like there is no no solution in sight, and that's changed quickly. Yeah, right. And, and you know the funny thing about a, a baseball season, Andrew, and I feel I've learned this during my time on the beat, and obviously players know this. Like they're not all going to be great. Some days you just feel like crap. You don't have it, you know. And it's all about like, can you push it forward? I, I, I know, like in our business, some of my favorite stories that I've ever written. Or ones where I just like didn't have it and I made something that was readable out of something that stunk. I feel like this game was sort of that. Um, the Oakland A's tried to give it away. Ten walks was absolutely terrible. You can see why Oakland is so bad. I'm sorry if I'm offending you or your family. <laughs> I don't I don't mean it that way. Not um, at all. <laughs> but, you know, and then the Pirates for parts of it were like, no, 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 no. You can try to give it to us, but we're not going to do it. Um, and, and probably the plays or the sequences that stand out the most are the things that Andrew McCutcheon did. Um, we talked to him a little bit ago in the clubhouse about, you know, getting a cutter going at his head, hits the deck, and then works an eight-pitch walk against a really, really hard thrower, um, seeing some hundred ones in there. Um, Austin Hedges told us, like, bro, that was the best at bat I've ever seen. Um, you know, and so they sort of figured it out in key moments, they got a win, and like you said, the important thing is extending it to six games. They're playing much better baseball in June. We're seeing further and further evidence that that May is just weird. I don't know if I have a, a great explanation for what happened there, but I do feel confident and more confident by the day that they put it behind them. Right, and I think uh, there is one thing especially true, which I, I you know, a point that we'll get into here is that um, you know, when you look at sustainable winning with baseball, there's, you know, obviously pitching comes to the forefront, you know, that's always huge. And in April, the story was of how they're getting so many quality starts. Um, and in May, obviously, you know, that streak ended, but they were still, for the most part, getting solid pitching uh, from the starters. I, I think within the context of the season, though, and it comes as no surprise, I mean, this bullpen, um, you look at it, it's been impressive. And if there's a team that ever is successful in baseball, um, it's usually with a great back end of the bullpen or at the very least a good bullpen in general, that group, it feels like has surprisingly even taken it to another level. Um, whether that's David Bednar saving three games in a row, um, having Holderman come in and get his first career save. And he's been nasty in that eighth, eighth inning role. I mean, that bullpen in general, like w what has made that group a as successful as it's been, because that's not something you could really say about pirates bullpens over the last couple of years. Right. No. And you and I had this talk in spring though, man, I remember this yeah. talking about like, can this group be better? Do we think they're going to be one sort of disprove people? Um, and, and I go back to something Will Crow said um, for, I think our preview story on it. And, and this even links back to a quote from Dylan Peters, who would have thought that Dylan Peters had an impact yeah. on the Pirates. <laughs> he said something like, who says that I can't improve? Like, who, who, who woke up this morning and said that we can't get better as players? And it's a great thing to live by. And that's what's happened. Like, look at Johan Ramirez. He wasn't good in spring. He's gotten better. He has had various problems in his Major League Baseball journey before this point and has continued to get better. Jose Hernandez has gotten better. Colin Holderman has gotten better. David Bednar has even gotten better. Um, and so you're looking at basically five guys back there and add Dari Moretta into the mix that ha they've been a really good nucleus for this team. And you give me those five guys. And after I was looking up stats before the game, they have their ERA is like under one over the past five or six or something like, I mean, that's just, that's crazy. They have the second lowest ERA behind the Padres in the national league. I know that. I mean, you know, this what this bullpen, let's not forget, last year was absolutely terrible. Yep. And they've been really good, man. I mean, you know, I like the different arm slots that they're using. Uh, lefty, righty, you've got Perdomo up here now, and I, I really like watching him pitch. He's a different look than they've had. Um, I think Chase DeYoung can still be a part of this thing. He's back now. It'll be interesting to see what they get out of Crow when he comes back. He's probably a month away. But they've got some good arms back there, and they're throwing it really well. Yeah, you touched on it right there, especially with DeYoung, the struggles that he's had this year now being back up, Crow being out for as long as he's going to be out. 
I mean, this this bullpen that we're seeing, the one that's been so successful, it's not like this was the opening day roster. It wasn't even right. what you envisioned maybe in December with Harleen Garcia being out, with no Crow, Dwayne Underwood Jr. You know, gets DFA'd, clears waivers. It's not the, the group that maybe was expected March 30th, but the group that's here is getting the job done. And I think that you got to give credit where it's due to the, the front office, right? Assembling this roster, assembling that depth that, you know, they can persevere through these kind of challenges that maybe – in other seasons, you wouldn't have been able to, right? Yeah, and I mean, it's not just the front office either. Like, I would, I would shine some light toward the the, the pitching group. Yeah. Um, you could say Justin Message in the bullpen, but Oscar Marin, Marine, the pitching coach, has also had something to do with it. And Radley Haddad, you know, game planning coordinator. Like, there's a bunch of people that that touch this, including the players themselves. So, uh, you're identifying people, and then you're coaching them up, and you're fixing things with them, and the players are taking to it. So, absolutely, and I mean. I would also caution, too, that it's June 5th. You know, yeah. we'd like to sit here and think that this is going to be this way for the entire season. Um, I'm not being pessimistic, just trying to be realistic that, you know, we, we're, we're not there. It's two months and some change. Yeah. So I hope this continues. I mean, there's a bunch of really good dudes back there, and it's been an, an integral story to this team so far. And I don't have any reason to believe that, you know, these guys are going to suddenly turn into pumpkins. They've pitched well. Um, I do worry about the inevitability of injuries. I think, you know, you can't get through a major league season without having to overcome some of them and where that depth comes from. I have some questions whether they're deep enough. I'm not sure that they are. But right now, based on what we've had up here and how these guys have performed, it's been really good. Yeah, Perdomo coming up looked impressive. I know it was only two-thirds of an innings from De Los Santos when he was up here, but given what he flashed last year, you know, that's a guy you maybe point to, but – um, you know, it's a valid question there, though, because after those guys, it definitely drops off a little bit. And uh, you had the concerns. But for the bullpen's sake, at least tonight got a little bit of a breather after covering what was it? Seven innings during the, the rain delay game and then five innings for Contreras start. And you'd think that tomorrow with Keller um, that theoretically maybe get a little of a break there, too. But maybe I'm totally jinxing it by saying that. Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> they should be back to semi normal. Right. I mean. You know, you're going to have Ramirez completely available tomorrow. You would have Dari Moretta completely available. I don't. I think Hernandez should be good. Bednar should be good. Like, you know, they're they're going to get back to it, and that's why you have Mitch too. I mean, you want him to pitch like an ace. He can go out there and, I mean, I, I still I've brought this up for probably too many times. I disagree with Shelton pulling him out after 84 pitches because he's your ace. Let him work. Like, I want to see 110 out of him tomorrow. You know, if you can get a CG out of him, fine. Maybe you can against this Oakland team, um, but you know that's I, I don't know. I, I I don't worry about the bullpen usage at this point. Yeah, I would maybe worry about JP Sears though. I mean, he threw 112 pitches or something in like four he was, he was in five innings. Crying <laughs> out loud, man! Efficiency, efficiency. Yeah, what was this game tonight? Three hours, thirteen minutes. Something imagine, like imagine it without a pitch clock, man. I can't believe we're recording this. It is five to midnight. Um, this feels like the good old days or the not so good old days where, you know, you're here late at night and, and doing the, the, the pitch clock has been such a life changer. We, we're, we're going back to the seven o'clock starts. You've got a slow game. Post game was pretty slow having to write and then do this. Like, oh, man, it's feel like 2019 all over again. Wow. Yeah. Well, I'm sure the Pirates are glad to not be in 2019, too. I'm, I'm sure they'll be in agreement with you on that one. Um, yes. what, one thing I wanted to get into uh, with you, I know didn't have as well as good of a day at the plate today, but um, keep Ryan Hayes. You know, you wrote about him um, this past weekend, obviously, uh, you know, the adjustments that he's made. You know, that rotten series against Seattle feels like years ago. And yeah. that was what, like a week and a half ago. I mean, what he showed in the St. Louis series. I mean, you know, those adjustments, like what have you kind of seen from Hayes now in the batter's box, not just the on-field results, beyond the home runs? What are you seeing from him in the batter's box, just comfort level? I see – well, uh, number one, I guess I see somebody who's actually comfortable. Um, and number two, I see somebody who has sort of stripped it down and it's more athletic. It's free and easy. Um, you know, you can talk about the toe tap and that's fine. To me, that's a rhythm mechanism. Um, I use that hitting i don't i don't view that as like he revamped his swing it's just something to make sure he's on time and i think that's the biggest difference with him he's just on time all the time and i don't like giving that answer that's like that something that shelton says a lot i don't feel like it's terribly informative but i mean i've seen hayes a lot and i've seen him 
tense. I've seen him think too much. I've seen him care too much. Um, and that's been sort of what I've been advocating for with that. And I think we've talked about it on the show is try your best to strip some of the thoughts and the over concern and all that stuff out of his brain. And I think they've done a very good job of that. Yeah, he got a day off on Memorial Day, the first day of the Giants series, did a little bit of work. Uh, but I think that's what they did with Andy Haynes is sort of going back to basic, back to basics, excuse me, install a little bit of rhythm in his, his load. And it's been fantastic. I love the way he's swinging the bat now, Andrew. I was asked earlier uh, before the game, you know, like, do you think this is going to stick? And I, as strongly as I felt with some stuff recently, like I, I think he's got some traction here. I'm not saying it's going to explode like September 2020, but there's certainly something I see here with Hayes that looks a little bit different. I'm curious to see how this plays out. Yeah, it's a big development. I mean, it, obviously the long-term extension, you know, get the financial commitment to him, what he does defensively. It's easy to say that, you know, anything you get from hit him hitting is a plus, which probably still it still rings true. But if you take that next step, that contract looks really, really good for Hayes. Yep. I mean, that's why they did it too. Again, don't forget, like that contract is a bargain because from the team aspect, they feel like he's going to grow into his offense and they're still going to get him for a cheaper rate by taking the gamble that he's going to grow into his offense. He signed the contract because it's a lot of money for theoretically no somebody who hasn't proven anything with the bat so far. Uh, I mean, he had some good minor league years, but it's not like he's done anything in the majors. So, um, you know, I, I think it's a deal that makes sense for both sides, but I think we need to remember too why that deal got done and, why it makes sense is that it's going to take some time for his offense to develop. And I understand that, you know, five games does not a trend make, but we are seeing some progress here. And I think it's fair to acknowledge that he's gotten better and looks better. Yeah. Progress to continue to monitor. And it's something that, you know, Bart's fans obviously definitely going to be keeping their eyes on. And I guess that kind of leads us into a, another topic, uh, some news from earlier uh, yesterday. And then obviously got the chance to talk with, uh, General Manager Ben Charrington today uh, wanted to get into the discussion. It's inevitable. Henry and Endy uh, get into that with Henry getting called up to AAA. Um, some interesting stuff, obviously, with Charrington talking about how they plan on divvying up those reps. Um, just kind of your takeaways from that, because I know both guys got in about 30 games catching behind the plate. It was a priority. You know, the team made that pretty clear. They want these guys catching every day or most days. Now that's not going to be possible, right? It's going to be an even split. What do you make of that dynamic? Was this the right time? Was this the right approach? Um, how do you evaluate this? <laughs> yeah, there's not a wrong time. Yeah. I, I wish, you know, I think Henry should have been in AAA weeks ago. Um, that he's up there now, great. Uh, I, don't, I don't understand splitting it at this point, Andrew. That's one thing that I, I feel like you're delaying the inevitable. Um, so, like you can't bring both of these guys to the major leagues, at least I don't think so and catch each of them like three days a week. I don't think that's fair to the pitching staff. I don't think it's fair to them. I'd like to see them pick a guy who's going to be their catcher, pick a guy who's going to bounce around to play other positions and work that relationship together. To me right now, that would be Henry catching Andy in the field. Uh, maybe Andy at first base, maybe, I don't know, Andy in the outfield. I don't know. But that's one thing that Charrington talked about today. He said Henry will probably see the majority of his like secondary position reps in right. Andy will see the majority of his secondary position reps at first base. Whatever. I mean, I, I don't have a, a hot take on the timing just because, you know, again, I, I wish it would have happened earlier. I think we probably are, you know, maybe two hot weeks from Andy away from him coming up. Uh, it will be safely past the Super 2 floating bubble by that point. Um, you know, and I think one of the things holding back Andy has just been his lack of production thus far. But yeah, I mean, I want to see how it plays out. I want to see what you think too, by the way. You're asking me what I think about all this <laughs> stuff, but you're the, you're the one going to Indianapolis tomorrow. You're going to talk to Henry and write the story about, um, you know, what he sees there and what he's working on. Uh, yeah. So what do you think? Yeah, it's a thank you for turning it on me, Jason. Much appreciated. Um, I, I My takeaway on it is I – I think it's the right play, right? It's it's the right time to be getting him up there. And to your point, probably could have been doing this a few weeks back. Um, the, the point to me that I think is worth bringing up is that um, which guy ends up getting up to the bigs first, I don't know that it should matter what the secondary position is. And I don't, don't know that it will matter. 
But for the sake of Henry, right, I mean, the outfield depth, I think if you're the Pirates, you feel pretty decent about the outfield depth that you have in terms of guys who can be facing lefties, um, you know, with Connor Joe out there. You can eventually, once McCutcheon, I guess, you know, you can put him out there at some juncture. Um, yeah, I look at it as who is going to be the guy who gets up there first uh, defensively and can contribute to catcher. And I think maybe that is Endy. Maybe that, that's what it's going to end up being just because he's been up in AAA longer. Um, that's the background that he's he's had by being up there and getting some more catching reps, whereas Henry's gotten a little bit more time in right. He was impacted by the injury, all that sort of stuff. So Endy is probably closer to being catcher ready, which, of course, you know means being big league ready. Um, but, uh, yeah, I just – I wonder how that part of the equation plays into it. That's what I ponder is does the secondary position – is that impactful enough to change who gets up there first, or is that not part of the equation? Because yeah. first base, you think, okay, well, Santana's there right now. G-Man Choi is coming back relatively soon, theoretically. Um, you know, eventually he'll have to do a rehab assignment. But I think that fact is in the equation a little bit. I just don't know to what degree. And I guess that's what impacts things for me is how does that impact which guy gets up there first and how quickly they try to do that with which guy. Yeah. And I, I think part of what they're doing here, and I agree with what you're saying, I think part of what they're trying to do here too is is straddle the now and the future. And I look at Endy as an example of that where – you say he can play first base. He's probably not going to need to play much first base this season. I, right. Look at their options right now. You're going to sign Santana. And if you keep Santana, I, get, I guess the scenario where Endy would play first base is if they decide to trade Santana, which means they're out of it and they've played crappy baseball. I, I do think that if the Pirates stay in contention here, they're going to keep Santana. I, I, I don't think that they'll – I don't think they'll trade a lot of guys, frankly. Like if they're around a playoff spot, if the central continues to be mediocre and the pirates were are within a couple games of the division, I mean, they would be crazy to start to give fans that, and then to start trading away pieces, um, especially on the pitching side. But, you know, anyway, I think one thing we're going to learn from all of this, Andrew, is, is seeing those guys in AAA, seeing them compete, see who's ready more behind the plate. I do think that should drive who gets up here. Um, I'm not in a hurry to bring them up here, frankly. Like I want a guy to put together several good weeks. And and I think that's sort of the way the organization is looking at this. It's not the way the fan base is looking at it. Like you go to AAA and you force your way up here. And Andy Rodriguez with four or five games is not forcing his way up here. He's just not. Um, you know, with two weeks, sure, he can. Um, but he has not performed terribly well. And fans want to see him, and that's great, and they're excited. But I just that would not be enough to make a move at this point. Yeah, and I'm I'm really curious about, because I know Andy touched on this a little bit, not too extensively, but I, I kind of want to pick Henry's brain about this a little bit, is the dynamic of being in AAA and having Miguel Perez as your manager, a guy who extensive catching experience, somebody who Andy spoke really highly of about how he's helping him in that aspect. I'm curious to see how that benefits Henry as well, because Andy talked about, you know, the growth that he's had there of how helpful these past two months have been of, you know, picking the mind of a guy like that, who, you know, is a pretty savvy veteran guy who, you know, a lot of time in the minors, defensive first catcher, all that sort of stuff. Um, I'm really curious to see how Henry rea re re reacts uh, to that aspect of it, how he benefits from that and how that can I don't know if it fast track is the word to it, but expedite that well, process. That was so darn important. Why wasn't he up? Why wasn't he in AAA <laughs> before? <laughs> and a a time-honored question, Jason. I, I have no answer to that one. I just I, – I don't understand that part of it. You yeah. know, like my, my feeling, I, I articulated it with going to the big leagues, and that should be predicated on, you know, performing well for an extended period of time at, at most of the time at AAA. And for a guy that I take 1-1, one, one, you're investing a lot of money in. Like, I don't think the organization's crazy for wanting to see him at AAA. Okay, that's fine. That's fair. So get him to AAA. Yep. We should be going on like week four or five of him in AAA, and instead we're just starting it. Um, but be that as it may, I just I, it also irritates me, Andrew. Like the the Not that I don't care about the prospects, but like the people clamoring for that – the, the major league team's five games over right now. The major yeah. league team is in first place. Like prospects are all well and good, but it's almost like people are conditioned to want the next thing. Like the current thing is at least competitive. It, what if what if they're actually good? Like you might want to watch. 
There's been yeah. so much bad baseball here. Don't miss the good stuff or the reasonably good stuff or whatever. Like, I, I don't know. I'll get off my soapbox right now. It's just like, you know, there's a competitive team here. Pay attention. Yeah. And there's two guys behind the plate who, you know, it's very different ways of getting the job done. But I think that it would be a lie to say that, you know, neither hedges nor delay has value. Right. I mean, what right. I just does with the pitching staff. Yeah. The offensive contributions this season haven't been great, but you look at the last four games, he's doing his share offensively, which, you know, you and I said before the season, it's like, yeah, if, if he hits 200 or better, like you take that. Right. And Jason delay is hitting over 300 and playing pretty darn good defense as well behind the plate. So it's like, yeah, the two guys might not be setting the world on fire offensively, hitting, you know, a combined 12 home runs or something like that. That's understood. But it's not like it's at this snail's pace of incompetence that you must rush these guys because they're not getting it done. No, they're right. helping out the pitching staff pretty well. And offensively, at least recently, it's been enough. I, I would say now would not be the time to be complaining. Maybe three weeks ago you could have had a gripe, but I don't know. Can I, can I go on another quick rant? Please. Real fast? Um, so there was so much complaint about Austin Hedges earlier this season in his offense, right? And it was centered around his drum roll, please batting average because his batting average was like 138 or whatever the heck it was. That meant he was a bad player, right? Well, they signed Austin Hedges and his batting average, batting average, the last couple of years, 163, 178, 145, 176, Right now, you know what Austin Hedges is hitting? 184. Yeah. So doesn't that mean if if previously, if previously he was a bad player because of his batting average of 138 right now, which is apparently in the minds of some atypical, his batting average is now the highest it's been since 2018. So wouldn't that the, the opposite be true that all of a sudden Austin Hedges is enjoying this like offensive renaissance because his batting average is higher? Or could it be that there's just flawed logic in evaluating a player based on batting average and maybe we should look at other ways to evaluate a player? But what would I know? I think you're getting ahead of yourself, Jason. I mean, the, the batting average is everything in baseball. Oh, my God. No, like I <laughs> – it just drives me nuts, man. Like Austin Hedges – you, you can get excited about Henry Rodriguez. Henry Rodriguez. I knew I was going to do that. Henry Davis and Andy Rodriguez. And also, like, see what Austin Hedges does for this pitching staff. I've talked to with Austin Hedges at length about what he does for this pitching staff and the value that he tries to find and the scouting and all this stuff. Like, I, his offense wasn't good. It isn't good. And it doesn't matter that much. The issue was that the rest of the offense sucked. So we're going to go pick on the guy with the bad batting average. Like, anyway, I, I just wanted to, that, that's that been killing me that like, he's actually hitting better lately. And like, nobody wants to talk about it. We just want to ignore it and con continually say that this guy with a bad batting average is like dragging down the whole operation. Yeah. And it's like, I don't know, right now it's been pretty good. And I don't know, I mean, selfishly, I, yeah, like selfishly, it's it's great. <laughs> I knew it wasn't going to be good. Yeah. I selfishly, I loved the play today in the ninth gunning down at Stuart Ruiz. I mean, that was poetry. Like, I, I loved watching that. It's like, man, look at this defensive contribution that is tangible. Like, now yeah. we can actually show people things that isn't just the, you know, the team ERA that he helps produce, the starters ERA, um, pitch framing, blocking, all that. It's like, oh, look at this. There's a tangible reason why, yeah, this dude is a really good defensive catcher. I appreciated that. Like, I don't know. It's it drives me nuts too, man. I'm, I'm right there with you. <laughs> Yeah, and I mean, if you say any of that stuff, like you're just going to be, oh, they're defending Austin Hedges. Oh, he loves Austin Hedges. No, I mean, you can admit that the guy's having a positive impact on the pitching staff, and he also isn't the greatest hitter in the world. And like, yeah. that hasn't changed from the moment they signed him. You know, you know what his offensive numbers are. You know what they're doing. They've even said, shoot, I'll give the Pirates credit for this. They've even said, like, we really prioritize the defense and the catching standpoint. Okay, great. Well, look at fan graphs like defensive outs above average. They're the best in baseball. Defensive runs safe. They're among the three or four best in baseball. Um, they're the best in framing. They, they've done the things well that you want catchers to do well. They've spent five million bucks on it for hedges, and they don't get much offense out of there. I don't know if anybody's looked, but like the premium offensive players at catcher, there aren't many. And yep. 
Yeah, not really an option to sign JT Romuto. And Wilson Contreras was pretty expensive for the Cardinals, and they look right. what they tried doing with moving him off it. That's eighty-seven million right there. I mean, that's that's another option, right? <laughs> like, hang on, let's do something fun real quick. Go you for know it. How, it like the B War. Yeah, Contreras has achieved so far. Uh, not off the top of my head, what do you got? Uh, 0. 0.5. Okay. So we got Hedgy. Got uh... ah, that went horribly. My <laughs> negative 0. 0.6. All right. Yeah, I think that's worth saving 80 million dollars, though. I'd I'd reckon. Yeah, I, I don't like having a negative <laughs> negative B war for five million bucks. That that ain't great. Um, but yeah, fun yeah. exercise. Yeah, fun exercise to make me look stupid. Not that it's hard, but uh, uh, no, I, I I still again for what the options are, I have no issue with it. I really I really don't. I'm fine with everything Austin Hedges has brought. And you know what, Andrew? When it, in this again, this is one of the things that's like it's tough to quantify. It's tough to explain to people. I'm also not explaining this fully because it's a story I'm working on in a couple of days. Um, but like, I want Henry and Andy up here to learn from Austin because I think there's value in that. So like, if this is the process that gets them up here sooner, great. But I think Hedges can be a very good mentor for them. Yeah, he has value. And uh, I, I, I agree with you, man. And I'm not just trying to, saying that to agree with you because it's midnight or anything like that. I'm I'm with you. Yeah, I think the best way to learn with these catchers is you put them with if you put them with a good brain. Jason LA talks about it all the time about how impactful Hedges has been to make him a better catcher. You know that's been great for the Pirates. He can do the exact same thing for either Henry or Andy. That yeah. can be true too. I'm not just disagreeing with you because it's midnight. That's good. <laughs> it's actually twelve fifteen now. Oh, man. Time flies when you're having fun, man. Come on. <laughs> All right. That's that's enough catcher talk. Are we good? No, we're good. We're good. good you got to get on the road to Indy. I got a game tomorrow. so Fun times. Fun. Take, yep. take care of my A's for me. All right. I will. <laughs> Sounds good. Thanks, everybody, for watching. We will catch you guys all next time. Thank you for checking out this content from Post Gazette Sports. If you liked the video, please like it and subscribe to our YouTube channel. If you enjoyed it on Apple Podcasts, please rate us five stars on Apple Podcasts. For six months of digital access to post-gazette.com for just $6, click the link down in the description.